And uh, yeah, I'm Markus Fahner and I'm going to give you a sort of non-technical talk. So everybody who has expected a technical talk with this, I'm sorry for that. I'll show you some things that may be funny and some concepts that I hope may be helpful. And uh, no matter if you are a tech nerd or user or whatever program or whatever, I think this is quite an important topic because uh, many people are addressing security in a, in a way that I think is not the full picture and maybe my talk can help, give the, give, help, can help create a full picture a little bit. So I, have, uh, I don't think anybody has seen this presentation before. I did it twice before but in European conferences. So, and oh yeah, it's meant, I'm, I am meant to be interrupted. If you have questions, just ask me right away. And uh, I've got a lot of, yeah, a lot of slides and stuff. So I will be faster in some parts and take more time in other parts, also based on your reaction. So just tell me what you think and what you like. Uh, this talk is called The Praise of Folly. I don't know if, some of you are familiar with Erasm of Rotterdam, something like four, five, no, 500 years ago. He said that uh, the whole world is like a stage or a theater, and the person that comes in and tells everybody that it's, it's just a play. <laughs> They're wearing masks. This beggar has played the king in the last play. That's just all just a theater. That this person would be driven out of the theater because he just spoils the whole play. And uh, I think this is something that happens in terms of security quite a lot. If we step in, if we, see, I, was, I will tell you about me also, but if we step in and tell people what you're doing is not safe, yeah, then some people are, yeah, will, will often react with, with anger <laughs> more than with sort of like common sense saying, yeah, yeah, of course it isn't. But... We have a lot of things that we carry with us. Another concept, anybody heard of cargo cult? Cargo cult science, yeah? Um, that are practices that have the semblance of being scientific but do not, in fact, follow the scientific method. It's a concept brought up by Mr. Feynman, whom I you know, sort of adore and his science. And he brought it up when uh, seeing some strange behavior from South Pacific Islanders when in first contact or in during the wars in more contact with yeah, the, the blessings of Western civilization as there are the planes and stuff and they were starting to uh, think of planes as gods and build altars with everything that the planes dropped because they thought by adoring or by, by um, praying to, to these planes that would make the planes drop down goods on their islands. And this, this seemed to work for them. Yeah? But the planes were coming anyhow. They didn't have the right uh, clue in terms of, uh, a co um, of, of consequence or action, reaction, whatever. So, uh, and in, in IT, in programming, Feynman or cargo called programming is the ritual inclusion of code or program structures that serve no real purpose. And that also exists in not only in programming, but also exists very much in everyday business life or computer usage. I'll have some examples for that later. I will provide all of these slides online. You can get them. Um, my presentations always share one thing. I have a lot of information on the slides and links to it. So they, the slides are also meant for further study if you're interested in stuff, so, they're, so, so don't worry if it's a lot of information and usually people tell me after my presentations they are full now. <laughs> so don't worry about that, that's just me. Another thing is I may, it may take five minutes for me to get going because it's early in the morning and late at night at the same time. I arrived on Thursday evening from, from Europe, so I'm a little bit jet-lagged, so my brain will start working soon, I promise, I hope. <laughs> So, <laughs> you need a firewall, <laughs> yeah, and antivirus, of course. Uh, I guess from your laughter, this is needless to say anything. You know what this is? Bug testing. 
<laughs> this is, this is, when I first saw the image, I was told this is how a bug managed to pass through QA. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> and one more. <laughs> if you're a programmer, of course, you always have to think about your user and how they will use the code that you program. But I like this picture because it clearly shows that no matter how creative you are and no matter what you think, the users will always be able to use it in a way you cannot even imagine. <laughs> And as you know, in the end, it, it'll be your fault because you didn't, <laughs> you didn't prepare for that corner case. <laughs> so this talk is about security theater. And uh, some of the best definitions come from Mr. Bruce Schneier, who's also always a good reader in terms of security. The security, we call him Pope <laughs> in Europe, the, the god of security writings or whatever. And he introduces the concept of feeling secure versus feeling insecure and the real state of security that you're in. You may feel secure, but you aren't, and you may feel totally insecure, but in fact you're totally secure or perfectly safe. And I, he's got some talks at TEDCOM and his uh, talk on the feeling security is a, a, a very good um, recommendation. So after this short introduction, I have to uh, I give you an agenda and I have on this a, a short disclaimer. Um, it's meant, this talk is meant to be understandable, as I already said. It's not a technical talk. And please don't lynch me for brevity or <laughs> inherent incompleteness in technical explanations. And I want this to be understandable also for children and managers. I am a manager, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so as you as you have hopefully already noticed we are in the middle of the starters with the, uh, some funny openings and some funny words about then there will be some words about me some definitions of security and security theater then a technical explanation of the OZ layers that you do not know yet maybe the layers 8, 9 and 10 and uh, of the main actors and plots in the topic uh, yeah, in the security theater and the second half of the talk will be full of examples. This is where I cut down, uh, depending on the, how the time proceeds, how we discuss or whatever. And at the end, I want to have a, a set of suggestions that I think might be helpful, at least for thought. And uh, I also have a video with me for this talk from a member of the European Parliament, Julia Reda. She's from the European Pirate Party. That's a party that is has strong ambitions in, in IT, IT security, data protection. And let's see if we get to that. That's just the, the ultimate filler if, I, if I'm too, way too short. <laughs> Sorry. It's also online, the video. So <clears throat> I guess there's only one guy in the room who really knows me or whom I've met before. Has anybody else? Do I, have I overseen some, over, overlooked? So only Cornelius knows me. I'm, yeah. My life is pretty funny. I, I have a lot of stories to tell, and um, looking looking back, I, I somehow like always like dealing with danger. I mean, volcanoes are familiar to you here in this part of the world, and this is me at the age of 18 on the top of the mountain Mount Stromboli, the most active European volcano, at a time when we we were still allowed to sleep up there, and that's my that's not sleeping bag, but the place I slept. What you don't see here, this is a sign that says, do not go beyond this point, and blah. So I somehow always like dealing with danger. That was in, and I like traveling, obviously. That's in Africa, in Serengeti, in National Park. And that's me sleeping in the front, and in the back there's this sign. And um, there's really no fence around it. So at night there were giraffes and elephants passing by. And I was wondering about why this small house that there is well, for the kitchen had such strong fences. And the next day, the, our African guides explained to us it's keep, to keep the animals out. And we were like, well, our tents were outside, weren't they? And he said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is how my, so I'm team lead at SUSE for documentation. I have 13 writers in my team who write SUSE documentation. And this is a picture they take from me from during a meeting. <laughs> and, that's how they see me. I don't know what that has to do with danger, but they post stuff like that about me. <laughs> I 
here's a little bit about me. I studied geography and I founded an, uh, my own IT company 20 years ago and that was when I first started to have my own employees with, of course, students, interns, apprentices, stuff like that. Then I did two years as a hired consultant for a company that called itself Bleeding Edge. And then I went to Linux Magazine, Germany, and for eight years I was a journalist there, wrote a lot of articles, met a lot of people, and had a lot of fun. And that's all uh, stuff where I learned how, I think the core learning of my life was how to get the most out of people over you, whom you don't have any power, so how to motivate and inspire people to do things. Both as, as journalist and also as consultant, it's like, you have to find out what people want because also in, in the open source world you can't force people to do something. I will talk more about that in my later talk today um, on uh, the Potatoes of Defiance which is about open source or leading open source enterprise teams. Um, and I have another talk today about PR for open source projects which is learnings from my, yeah, from my life as a journalist. And since 2015, I'm at SUSE, and this is the fir my first real job as a people manager. And I, I really enjoy it. It's a crazy ride, but I love it. Um, SUSE, maybe a word about SUSE. We are the oldest enterprise Linux company that is still around. We had our 25th anniversary two years ago. We founded in 1992. And, or two years ago, last year, 19, founded in 1992. And uh, I, yeah, I took this job at SUSE because I saw that the company had always been very, very creative and uh, in many places the first to do things. We were the first to coin the term Enterprise Linux with, together with IBM in the late 90s, early 2000s. You may remember when IBM announced they'd invest two billion in Linux. They had their IBM set. Did you say set or C series? C series, you say, right? The the mainframes, and they and they said that the Linux on this that that's enterprise Linux. That was when it was when the term was coined. We did a lot of things like KVM or uh, Sen or uh, support for AMD or ISDN. And a lot of people, a lot of those people who developed that stuff is still around, especially in the Nuremberg or Prague office. So it's really funny to meet those. These guys who are as old as I am, but who did great things in the 90s already. Yeah, I have a lot of stories to tell. I spare you the details, maybe during the day or as, the, as it goes. And uh, <coughs> the core thing I already said in the open source world is just for fun. And that's what I also learned from, from Linus Torvalds and his, or his family. This is an island in Finland where Linus spent his... Uh, summer holidays every year as it's tradition in Finland and I went there to do a, a yeah a photo story home story of the Torvalds and this is Linus's father and me on his boat driving to the island and li I, why is this pictures these pictures in here because I think this is the sentence that best describes what motivates us in the open source world most of the good programmers do programming not because they expect to get paid or get adulation by the public but because it's fun to program and that is one of the core learnings of my life. In my own company, I, and this may be pictures that seem familiar to some of you who were around in the 90s, so that's what a company looked then, that's what a data, what my, my first data center looked like. And look, look at the fantastic AC that we had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the, the, the program management, <laughs> project management. And that is where I learned that I had to deal with, what, what was it with? with money, taxes, project management, customers, and that you end up, as, as a consultant, that usually you end up between the chairs. Between the chairs of, this makes sense, this is what the customer wants, and this is what, in the end, my boss wants. Yeah? My boss wants to make as many, that I do as many hours at the customer as, as the customer as possible. The customer wants to be, have as li pay as little as possible, and, and you're in the middle, you know, you as a consultant, you may know exactly what the customer really wants and with what he might be happy also in three years. <laughs> and you have to find your way between these three things. And uh, yeah, I wrote quite some stuff for Linux Magazine and some books. And the one thing that was always hmm, around and really 
gave the biggest impression or made, left the biggest impression on me is that I had to deal with several views, several fragile elements that had to be combined. Yeah? Like this. You have the open source, motivation, inspiration thing, and you have the business success at the same time. And how do you get these two things together without both popping? And that is one of the things that also made me uh, create this talk. Um, has anybody ever been to Utah? Yeah? Cool. That's the um, Little Sahara. Uh, I don't know if it's a national park or natural park, but they have, they're driving around with, with quads in the dunes. Yeah? And so when you enter the park, they have this Simpsons-style sign. <laughs> Do you feel safe? <laughs> it's four days since the last accident. Huh? And uh, that's already giving us uh, the feeling of how do you f define security? Bruce Schneier, in his talk that I really recommend to watch, says it, we have three sides. We have models of reality, then we have the reality itself, and then we have the feeling of the people, and they are competitive in terms of uh, security. You have real security, you have the security that you may get from, from things like, yeah, like compliance, and then you may have the feeling that people say, oh, all those things that we do in a company, they, they don't work, but we just do that. And so um, another approach is from Win Schwartow, and very old, but a very good book that I recommend is Time-Based Security. He says security is always just a question of time. You cannot be secure forever. It's just a question of, for example, how long is your password safe? Simple, expressed in a simple way. Then we, we in the open source world, we have this approach of control and transparency. I would say nothing is secure where you cannot look into the source code and where you cannot validate that the source code is really the one that's running your system. <coughs> or that the source code is the one that the software that's running your system has been compiled from. So I would, yeah, I'll... <coughs> we have this model of security versus trust. So if you use software where you don't have the source code, if you use, like um, Snowden uh, called it, uh, vector-friendly software, which we used to call proprietary software in the, in the former times, um, then you have the model, the trust model. You trust the vendor. You may trust Microsoft, Apple, whom, whoever the, uh, is giving you this proprietary software, and then you may feel secure. But this is not my approach or not the open source approach, because we tend to think rather there will be no security without open source. Yeah? It will be no, uh, you, you will not be able to really check if this is safe, secure, truthful, or uh, similar. Because you either trust the vendor or you, can, you are able to check it yourself. I'm not saying anything new, I guess. But some of you may be familiar with the model of security by obscurity. Um, another problem is, and another good book, another good read, is called Buddha's Brain. It's uh, by uh, th two authors with three main core competences, neuro a neurologist, a Buddhist, and a psychologist. I don't know which is which, but these three core competences blend into each other in this book. And it's a really good read, not only in terms of IT or leading people, also in terms of understanding personality and what's going on inside somebody when you're feeling bad or when you're feeling good and why negative things have more impact on your feeling than, than positive things, even if they are the same size. And uh, what's in this book, very interesting, you know, we have um, huge problems when we are assessing dangers. And that is because we are tribal, that is from our roots in biology and in, in evolution and in the, in over the time as we grew to be humans. It was just healthy to be more cautious, huh? to be more negative about this thing that lies on the, on the floor in the forest. Those who thought this is a stick and tried to take it may have survived, whereas those, no, may not have survived. Whereas those who recognize that it's a snake, yeah, being negative, oh no, that may be a snake, they may, they may be uh, more successful in the terms of evolution. 
a good read, this book. I can only recommend it. What is security? It is, and this is the definition. I like it's a good, it's a good, the good feeling an admin has in the evening when he goes home, when he leaves work, knowing he has done all he can to protect the services, machines, and colleagues. And what you, also, what you already see here is that also the Oxford Dictionary has this, the different components. It says security, the state of being free from danger or threat, the safety against criminal activities, procedures followed, and the state of feeling safe. Now, already there, the feeling gets in. So, what is security theater? You may already got, have got that, understood that now. It's the practice of investing in countermeasures intended to provide the feeling of improved security while doing little or nothing to achieve it. Researchers have described the airport security repercussions after 9-11 as being <coughs> security theater. Uh, you, you're familiar with the TSA key story? Yes. So these TSA keys, these TSA locks on your, on your suitcases there, yeah? we, we always were skeptical about that because if there is one master key, it will spread. Yeah? But now we've got something new recently. This is from April 25. Well, some of you might be in a hotel where you have the key card at the moment, yeah? This device helps you if, you've got, if you lost your card. <laughs> <laughs> Works worldwide. <laughs> and uh, in a million of hotel rooms. The background, st uh, read it, the background story is also very funny because it was a hacker who had lost, uh, the hotel chain said he has lost his laptop. He said it was stolen from his room. And they said, no, the system is safe. And he said, challenge accepted. It took him 10 years. But then he came up with this device. He had found the flaw. <laughs> and uh, now, we, now they got it. So did they give him the money back for his laptop? Oh, I don't know. He, uh, this is, I just read that when, uh, when he was, that, that, that was still in process. Okay. Huh? Right. So we learned one thing. For human nature, feeling secure is more important than the reality. If someone unveils the theater, the feeling secure is gone instantly. It's like quantum entanglement. If I tell you this is not secure and if I can prove it like I just did with your hotel room, yeah? it's, in, it's gone instantly. Um, another concept comes in that I coined the term for, uh, the, the term blameware. I don't know if you heard of that. Um, <coughs> I, I wrote this in 2008 or 09 somewhere because of an incident in German administrations. Blameware is software that a company or an institution buys to outsource the blame if something goes wrong. Uh, for example, yeah, Microsoft, IBM, they are famous for, or Siemens, they are, in Germany they are famous for, no admin, no manager has ever been fired for buying stuff from IBM, Siemens or Microsoft. Because if it doesn't work, it will not be his fault. Because millions of people all over the world are using this stuff. We, they can't all be wrong. It must be unforeseeable. So that's blameware. When you, when you know the situation is all fucked up, you can't do anything, but you find someone that you can buy stuff from to present to your manager and say it's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the article that I wrote. It was about the yeah, Department of Foreign Affairs, which is some... I think Secretary of State is... Uh, the, 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 is the minister that does foreign relations, right? Yeah. Yes? So the Department of Foreign Relations is one of the departments of the Secretary of State in Germany. And they had Linux and they went back from Linux because they couldn't handle it. <laughs> and they couldn't handle having the blame for every software mistake. And that was yeah, a long time ago. So uh, what we learned from that is, <laughs> this is from Wikipedia, um, you may know, and that is as technical as I will get, you will know the seven layers of the OSI, huh? which go up from the physical layer to the application layer. But what I really like is this idea of having a user layer above the service layer, above the services layer. Huh? We have the individual, or as we say in OSI layer 8, we say the bug or the problem is sitting in front of the screen. Mm. Huh? <laughs> that, but that's not all. When I, when I, when I, 
read for this presentation, I also found that we have a layer 9. Then the organization he's in, so the user may do everything fine, but the organization is flawed, or worst case, the government. In some places, you may be able, if you have to switch those two, government, organization. Huh? And as I said, the first ones are technical. I have to speed up a little, I think. They yeah. are technical. Uh, um, and yeah, the, the important thing is information passes through um, <coughs> incoming data travels up and outgoing data travels down. And that, these layers fit perfectly into the scheme, I think. So when we have this as the sort of the stage, what, are the act, what do the actors want? Let's go from down from the top level. The politicians, they want to be re-elected, nothing else in most cases. Oops. Um, the corporations, we want, to ha we want or have to make more money. Yeah, the intentions are pretty clear. The managers, therefore, want to do, I want you to do what I need for my boss career or money. That's also pretty clear. The user, it's a little, a little bit more tricky. I don't want to change. I don't want no stress. I don't want to learn. I want simple solutions that integrate with my habits. And you have already lost me after the second sentence of your explanation. I need simple and understandable solutions. That's pretty much as I have learned what most people, they just want to do their work and be fine with it. And the IT people, that's us, yeah, we stand there, we say, oh my god, no, the head hits the table, and have you tried turning it off and on again? If somebody knows the IT crowd. And there we have the triangles, these triangles between secure, fast, and usable, or secure, fast, and cheap. And at different levels of, uni of enterprise IT, one of those two triangles matter. So, Plots in the theater, the classical plot. Anybody familiar with Terry Pratchett? I guess so, huh? Someone will always try you some strange sausage. That's just normal, that's one of the plots regarding blameware, for example. Then, uh, then there, there will be some industry, like the antivirus industry, coming in and say, tell you, we can help you, this, we've got the perfect snake oil for you, it will help for everything. Drink it or start your car with it. Um, they will, the, the, the other concept is, give us all your data and you won't have to worry. Yeah, we need more control because everybody wants job security. That's also a classical meme of the, yeah, say conser of the conser of conservative politicians, at least in Europe. Yeah, trust me, I know what I'm doing, slash hammer anybody. <laughs> Famous 80s TV show, trust Hell me, yeah. I know what I'm doing. Hell yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, one of my favorites. If you stick with us, you're safe. <laughs> and uh, as I said before, if security theater is uncovered, trust is destroyed, but customers will need new products. That's shoot the messenger before he tells anybody. That's one of the wonderful management anti-patterns. And if somebody tells the world that something is insecure, you or your marketing has to be already there and tell them, yes, we know, and here is new and improved. That's another pattern. Um, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> another term which gives, will give you a lot of fun for a weekend of reads is anti-patterns. Have you heard of anti-patterns? Anti-patterns are patterns that are being used despite the making sense. So security theater or the behavior is in, in itself a huge anti-pattern. But management anti-patterns are very common. Do you know Yamfi? Yet another meeting will fix this. <laughs> will fix it. Or conference bingo. You know the sheets where you can uh, strike out the words that have been said. So the, like the, bull, the, the bullshit bingo. You can do it with conference or with... with uh, um, how do you say, uh, phone conference, video conference, yeah? Can you hear me is one of those, <laughs> hello, it's also one of those. Um, then we have consultants, that's also, that's what I like to call an anthropomorphic personification of blameware. Not always, but in some places, yeah? <laughs> now you got it, huh? I did this job, so I know what I'm talking about. Um, we have coders, and on, have you heard of onion code? I've seen this with huh? layers, and layers, 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 layers and layers and layers because you don't understand the initial code. I'm sorry, ogres. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> huh? Ogres have layers. 
Ogres? Ogres. Ogres. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, like, for example, I know this from a big or a PHP project I once saw that there was some PHP code and obviously the developer had left the company. New developers came in, didn't understand the PHP code. So what they did was make a wrapper around it that just uh, prevented the error message from being sent and <laughs> triggered an action that was, if this error message comes, then do this. Yeah? But that wasn't at all. The next time this developer had left and the next developer came in and he didn't, all, he didn't understand why he did this and he did his own wrapper around. So the thing that we found were four layers of that. So that's onion code. Yeah? And uh, the initial reason for the error message gets lost. Um, yeah, and nerds. And that's really tough because we tend to say, you can't, we tend to be so fatalistic. You can't be totally safe, so why bother at all? Huh? The NSA, the Russians, the Chinese, so why do you care at all about security? We can't be safe. And that's, that's, that's also wrong. Exactly like, have you tried turning it off and on again? Or this gen is the internet? <laughs> And uh, another mask disguise costume is the fool and the art of complaining. And that is something you will have with users. Worst case, if, if your users are nerds, like in, in, in tech companies. My computer is a mess. This software never works. Why is the internet network software login always so slow? Yeah, the art of complaining. And yeah, we Europeans, especially Germans and Czech people, where we have our biggest offices, we socialize through complaining. This is completely different from standard American behavior. So if you, if you, Americans, if you meet somebody who's, if you ask him how are you, and he'll tell you the full story about his broken knee last year and his wife ran away and whatever, yeah? you'll be like, what a jerk. Europeans will be like, hey, cool, poor guy, come on, let's have a beer, and blah, blah, blah. So we socialize through complaining. So if you, if you ever happen to be in a German office, don't worry if somebody tells you his full life story just because you ask him, hi, how's it going? <laughs> it also works the other way around. We, we are surprised that Americans always ask us how we, go, how we do. <laughs> Even if we met yesterday or hours before or whatever. So we, Germans like to uh, think of that as a real question. <laughs> and then we start complaining because that's how we socialize, okay? <laughs> so that's the part where I can cut down the... I think I have 10 more minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, cool. Our problem is cognitive bias. There is a lot of it around. I learned this from the Buddha book that I showed you. This is a huge graphics. There's the link somewhere coming up. All of these are different ways of cognitive bias. Cognitive bias is basically convictions or assumptions, convictions that we have or assumptions that we make about how things work and what we want to believe. Our subconscious tells us we want to believe this. Most of them have their roots in evolution and in the fact that we are tribal. Oops. And uh, that leads to the fact that we have trouble judging dangers or assessing dangers. Yeah? The brain works in a way that the more vivid something can be imagined, the more dangerous it may appear to us. Yeah? That's, for example, why... Uh, a plane crash, they, they hardly ever happen, but they are so big and vivid in our imagination that we think planes are more dangerous than cars. Huh? Or bicycle helmets. The statistic, statistics can prove that pedestrians and housewives, or housemen, uh, are more in danger to suffer from a fatal head injury than, than, bicycle, than cyclists. That's really statistical proof. But nevertheless, it is something that we feel safe with. And that is the difference. Same, what I would say, and this is the thing between Europe and America, code of conducts. They are meant to give people the feeling of security. In Europe, we have laws that cover pretty much exactly what is stated in, in, in most of the code of conducts. Yeah? But uh, the question is, do we reach the ones we address? So do we really make a change except for the feeling of security? I don't know. It's, or the, big, the war on drugs. Portugal in Europe has, um, for example, has been very, very successful in saving millions of money by uh, making all drugs, also hard drugs, legal. And they were the first ones in Europe, and everybody said, oh my god, you're going to go down in chaos, totally. Yeah? But they had 
very, very positive effects. There's also a great TED talk on that. So, or CCTV. The city of London has almost full coverage with surveillance cameras. And at the same time, they didn't have any positive effect on criminality or on, on terrorist things happening there. So these are all things where we have different mindsets or different thoughts about, then there is proof on uh, how things work out in the end or on, on the success. So now we're coming to the fun part, which I'm going, what was that last one? Polygraphs. Polygraphs. Yeah, also an interesting concept, Wikipedia pseudoscience. Polygraphs have been long ago proven to not work, but still they're in use. Because we don't care, because we want to believe. <coughs> yeah, now we're coming to some fun part. Apple introduced two-factor auth, did you know, some months ago? You now need the username and the password. <laughs> <laughs> Which, which password do you click, though? The apples? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the middle one. Um, or in, in 2012, I don't know if you have Mobile TAN as an authentication to factor auth for banking here, like SMS, TAN, T-A-N, transaction number sent through SMS for mobile banking. You have that too, yeah? I had an article in 2012 where banks told us that it's insecure, but they also, in the same, in the same event, they told us journalists, <coughs> it's insecure, we know it, but we'll keep using it until it's being exploited. <coughs> Good. We know those breaks don't work, but once more, more than 1,000 people had hit a tree, we will repair them. That's the fingerprint of the German Secretary of State. He once said, my fingerprint is safe, and biometrics is safe, and everybody can have my fingerprint. Well, the Chaos Computer Club from Germany, they got his fingerprint from a glass. You leave your fingerprint everywhere. Is that what you want to do with your password? And you only have 10 of them. So if, you want, if one is compromised, you have nine, you just calm down. <laughs> yeah. A fingerprint is more a username than a password, like is all of biometry. It's more a username than a password. It's more a login than a password. And I like that. That's the, th the third iteration. So now you have a stamp for, if you have the right oil that you put on the stamp, then you can use uh, Mr. Schäuble's fingerprint to unlock your phone. <laughs> Schäuble the secretary of was the then Secretary of State in Germany. Yeah, Rick Astley. <laughs> the uh, Internet of Things. Ooh. Yeah, I like that. So they, they hacked Sonos and Bose speakers to chat with Alexa and said, uh, hey Alexa, can you uh, uh, order, uh, MP3, order Rick Astley MP3? Yeah? And please play it and then, you, then the users got Rick rolled. Thousands of them, millions. <laughs> An Internet of thing is, uh, Things is totally safe. And South Park also did that. Great 20th, uh, season of South, 21st season of South Park, the first episode, Wonderful, but turn off Google, Alexa, Siri before you start it because you'll, they'll be caught in a loop and you have things that are not suitable for children on your shopping list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this may have been not so funny for some of you. The missile alert in Hawaii some months ago. And he, this poor guy just forgot his t Twitter login. But why, why, why Twitter? <laughs> well... Yeah, government are some of the actors. What you see here is a secret military base in Afghanistan. Yeah? But it shows up perfectly on the data of a sports tracking device. Okay. Yes, and the soldiers like to do sports. They like to run around and check their, check their performance. Yeah? Now, obviously many of them didn't know that the device tracks and publishes the, the routes within the, the, the base. And of course, they made it online. And th there's more to it. What was that? Ooh. <coughs> Why is there a black screen? Hmm. Um, Shodan is a very interesting website about hacks of the Internet of Things, and he built a ship tracker. So uh, he found out that, did I, do I have a picture of the antennas too? No, I don't. He found out that the, the, the satellite uplink internet router on the ships, on, on commercial vessels, is basically like a router for at home. 
just that you use satellite uplink. In the satellite uplink network, this is uh, unencrypted, so you can see all the neighbors. And this uplink uh, routers, they have, most of them had standard passwords. So once you've got one, you have all of them. And so he, he, he took the, the map from uh, DEF CON, he took the DEF CON map, and uh, at this point he had found 108,682 uh, huge ships, <laughs> yeah? and the locations. But not only ships, he also found a gas station in Kansas with the data, the temperature of the gas tanks under, under the, so he, he was like, okay, I, and he could, he could um, falsify GPS signals to ships. Hmm? So I used to be in the Navy and we used to do cell phone liberty when we were close. And they stopped that because they were worried they could mm -hmm. track us by the, by the towers left for 150 dudes calling home. Yeah. So this, the ship tracker is, is really cool. <laughs> and, but as we know, again, part of the theater is uh, the Russians. <laughs> they are like a part of the blameware game. And also the antivirus companies. And especially if they, if it comes together, like here, when the Russians, that's really too much for me then, when they hack antivirus software to gain access to NSA secrets, wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a study from 2008, I think, uh, the, the, from the US National Vulnerability Database, and it shows the rise of attacks that come in through antivirus stuff. So I have to jump over some hacks. <sighs> And a good book recommendation is Skada and Me about Internet of Things and control for industrial uh, uh, scale. So if you want to know how Stuxnet worked and how, you, how, why power plants are prone to be hacked, read this book. It's very short and it's a uh, comic. So what I think what we need, okay, passwords, much more, much more, many more articles. Yeah, and I promised to say something about responsible disclosure. Uh, it's an old topic in the eight, from the 1850s of lockpicking, the lockpicking guru, Mr. Hubs. He already said, if you know about a security leak, publish it, because you're probably not the first. The other guy is probably an evil guy who didn't publish it. And by publishing it, you're helping everybody. So don't hold back with your this, don't, public dis, uh, responsible disclosure. I cannot recommend it at all. So my, and you have, we'll, I'm almost done time-wise, what I would call for is we need something like public code, public responsibility. I think it's pretty clear that there is no real security without open source, so we should enforce open source into more parts of our society that are security related. And the lawmakers have to define the rules for that, I think. Yeah? So open source has to play a bigger role. <coughs> it's no guarantee for security, but there's no security without it. You can also code bad code in open source. You know that. We have a, a campaign in Germany that is simply called public money, public code. Full stop. And uh, we should discuss whether we should introduce software liability. I don't know the situation in the US about that. And exempt open source software from it, maybe. Might be a thing. And make open source mandatory for certified secure infrastructure, like we do in, in traffic. We have cars, and the cars are tested. We have drivers, and the drivers have a license. And the license is tested. And only if the car and the driver are tested, then they are allowed to, to, to use the roads. Isn't there any kind of solution that we could use for, for our uh, IT? And some examples for that. You see, the problem that we have at the moment is that security politics follows the ratchet model, or the, the, the ratchet model, or like a zip tie. It's getting stronger and stronger, tighter and tighter, but we never go back. We keep solutions, we keep laws, even though we know they don't work. And that is a problem because we cannot go back beyond that point. And that's why I, and this is my last thing for now, that's why. I think we should uh, discuss about sunset clauses in any security-related measure, not only from, from company to politics. We need to define clear goals before we take these measures. We need to do reviews, and we need to find mechanisms for missed goals. So 
So uh, sunset clause is something that means like, okay, here's the law, and in one year we will reassess this. If these goals have not been met, the law will be obsolete. The same thing happens when there is no discussion about it, because then it's not important. In France, in the 80s, for example, there was a law about speed limits in villages. I love that. I don't know why they got rid of it, but this, there was a law that I was driving to France, and so many cities had a speed limit of 60 in the city. Nine, or not 60 uh, miles, 50. 50 miles. I'm like, why are you allowed to go that fast here? And then I asked people, and they said, yeah, there's a law. If, if more than 60% don't respect the speed limit, it has to be upgraded. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this is a very French way. <laughs> so, <coughs> what's happening here? Yeah, this is my last slide. Until then, common sense is no witchcraft. Ask yourself against whom do you want to protect? You will need a secret service to protect against the secret service. Um, so, if you don't know the Pareto rule, look it up. 80% is enough you won't be able to reach 100%, not 100% security, not 100% efficiency, not 100% open source if you do a migration from proprietary software. But 80% is enough. Managers, do your homework, create goals, review some checks and enforce them. Users, be ready to learn again and again and install a culture of errors and mistakes. This is how we learn. I love that we have a culture of errors and mistakes at SUSE. This is something very, very new and interesting for many of the American people that come to SUSE because they are like, wait, 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 I'm allowed to make mistakes and then we manage we tell them, yes, that's how we learn. We learn from the mistakes that you make, that's fine. Yeah, and the last sentence, open source is mandatory for security. There's no security without. And that would be the the content of the video. Not all politicians are stupid or ignorant of open source. Some really know, but they have other goals. So, no time left for discussion, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have my next talk at 12, which is about PR and open so uh, PR for open source uh, projects. And another one at 3.30 about um, leading enterprise open source teams. Thank you. And I'll be around. Is there direct next talk or is there a little break?